section is pretty dry compared to the rest of it anyways, so they're, they won't be missing too much. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Rachel Bestuda. I'm the Tri-State Fair Professional Development Project Coordinator. Um, I just, just a little bit of information about our project. Uh, this webinar is part of the Tri-State Fair Professional Development Project. It's funded through the USDA and Northeast Fair. Uh, it is a collaborative project among the universities of Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. We are currently in our first year of a new three-year grant program, uh, and this year we're focusing our efforts on pasture management and infrastructure as it relates to sustainable livestock production. Today we're specifically focusing on some tools that can be used in pasture assessment. Uh, we'll have a presentation, we'll be viewing a video, and there'll be time in breakout rooms, uh, which should give us some, some good time for some discussion uh, and socializing. We'll automatically move everyone in and out, so certainly don't worry about uh, trying to get yourself somewhere. Um, we will be doing that for you in the background. Uh, just a quick note that we do have another webinar coming up on August 25th which ties directly back to the uh, grazing series that we started earlier this year, uh, the, where we created work to create a grazing plan. Uh, we'll be assessing a farm in Eastern Connecticut uh, and providing feedback to the producer. Um, so that is to come on August 25th. If you're interested, make sure you register for that. And again, we are offering a certificate of participation. So those of you who are with us today who also joined us earlier in the year for our webinar series, uh, you have completed the requirements uh, for the, the certificate of participation. Uh, so you'll be seeing that come to you within the next uh, month or so. I think at this point, um, I'll hand it over to Joe Benelli, who is the Connecticut State Fair Coordinator and he's also the PI on the Tri-State Fair Project. Uh, he can discuss some opportunities through, uh, for us that are available through Northeast Fair. So Joe, go right ahead. Thank you, thank you, Rachel, and uh, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to today's uh, uh, program, and hopefully be able to attend uh, the programs uh, coming up in the latter part of the year uh, as well, too. Uh, Northeast Fair uh, provides a lot of funding to a lot of different grant programs. Uh, what Rachel has up on the screen right now is an overview of some of the, the major grant programs that are that are offered. The one I wanted to two I wanted to highlight would be the farmer grants, uh, and and those are uh, projects uh, basically that uh, would provide a grant to farmers uh, looking to test an idea, et cetera. Uh, it has on the screen right now uh, up to up to fifteen thousand dollars, but I believe that's been changed to up to uh, uh, thirty thousand dollars. And and uh, those are those should the the uh, request for proposal should be coming through uh, you know sometime late this year. But that's an opportunity for farmers and growers throughout Connecticut or right in the Northeast to apply for a, a substantial grant, basically to try it out an idea for innovation, uh, et cetera. Uh, the other one I want to draw your attention to for those of us that those of you that work with farmers uh, uh, or growers as well, you may be a farmer plus also with an ag advisor that we have partnership grants, uh, and those are up to $30,000 as well, too. So that's such a, an idea, basically, where you're looking to say, you know, kind of test an idea and working with a farmer, you know, to test that idea. And that provides uh, grant uh, grants up to $30,000 as well, too. And those requests for applications should be coming out, uh, hopefully, uh, late uh, late next spring. Also want to mention that this this overview sheet is up on our, our Northeast Air uh, pro uh, Project website. Please note as well too that Northeast Air provides many, many different kinds of resources as well too. So you can search, you know, other projects that are out there. Uh, they have a lot of publications as well too. You might find uh, of interest. And if you've got an idea you want to test, uh, maybe search their, their their website to get a sense of uh, other projects that might maybe like yours. Uh, one thing that Sir likes to do is to not fund uh, projects or data or information that may already be out there as well too. So. One way to do this may simply be to kind of search and find out what's out there, what's available, what you might be able to utilize in, in your farm operation uh, as well, too. And lastly, before I turn over to Rachel, if you have any questions uh, concerning uh, all of these grant programs, other grant programs or resources uh, that are offered through Northeast Air, 
uh, please feel free to reach out to me as well too. I'd be more than happy to chat with you to answer some of your questions and, pro and provide some information in terms of some of the resources that are available at Northeast Sarah as well too. So without further ado, uh, Rachel, I'll turn it back over to you. And thank you so much. Let me know, reach out, uh, and I can get you those questions. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. That certainly helps give us a little bit of guidance uh, moving forward. Just real quick, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, our first slide. He has worked with Connecticut Farmers since 1996 and has been with the Connecticut NRCS uh, since 2004. He's currently serving as a state agronomist and works primarily with animal production farms related to manure management planning and grazing or pasture planning. Among others, uh, Jim also finds himself working in areas related to cover crops, soil health, and soil erosion. He enjoys sharing his knowledge, but what he loves most is learning from others. He seeks to learn about their experiences and uses that information to continuously work toward better farm systems thereby providing or improving rather uh, both the environment and agricultural production on local farms. And our second speaker today is Susan Perry. She is the Pennsylvania State Grassland Conservationist for NRCS. She develops technical guidance for conservation standards related to agriculture and grazing, implements training programs for NRCS staff and service providers, and assists in coordination of the Pennsylvania Grazing Lands Coalition. Susan has a degree in environmental resources from California University of Pennsylvania and a degree of public administration with a minor in environmental policy from Penn State Harrisburg. She is a volunteer member of several community-based organizations and emphasizes stewardship of the natural resource base in both her career and personal activities. Uh, so these two will be our speakers today. And with that, if you could just give us a second to switch over, I will um, hand it off to both uh, Susan and Jim. All right, thank you, Rachel. Appreciate that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a very fun program for you. Very excited to present a uh, method related to assessing your pasture. And there are course, a number of different ways to assess pastures, but we're going to focus most of our time and energy today talking about what we refer to as the pasture condition score. And uh, we're fortunate enough to have one of the team members that helped develop this, Susan Perry from Pennsylvania, and, uh, and be a part of this conversation. But this, this worksheet was actually part of a national effort uh, to put together protocols uh, released in January of 2020, but originally developed in 2011, all, all from some research and efforts through the USDA ARS specialist, Jim Cropper, and a number of other university specialists that were working on a method to document pasture conditions and then be able to look for ways that we can make changes, improvements, uh, things that we want to see, see improved on our pastures. So this assessment, which is a benchmarking, taking current conditions and then monitoring, uh, using methods to monitor these changes, they can be used by anyone. They can be used by farmers, they can use, be, be used by the conservation staff, agronomy professionals uh, out in the field to measure and record pasture health as a result of the grazing. So as the grazing or conditions are changing, you can use this to to record those events over time. So I would encourage you to take, take the time to read through the, the entire guide, the pasture condition scoring guide. And then what we're gonna be focusing on today is the actual score sheet where you fill in uh, values to try to, to develop a score based on uh, targets that have been developed uh, for, for assessing pasture. So there are other less formal methods if we go to the next slide. So some of the four commonly used tools to, uh, to assess the pastures, these tools can be used individually or in combination for pasture assessments. These include walking the pasture, which is just the most basic, uh, the basic thing that we can do. The second method is using a grazing stick. And this is a tool that helps us to estimate the forage production and to guesstimate the initial paddock size 
more time needed in the, in the padding. A third option is the step point data collection. And this is just an unbiased assessment and uh, gathering observations to record. And then the pasture condition score, this is that nationally approved protocol to assess the plants, animals, and soils in the pasture. So if we, if we just take a moment to look at each one of those, and we move over down to the walking the pasture. This is the most basic of just the visual monitoring. And everyone is very likely monitoring your pasture, even if you don't realize it, anytime you walk through it. But this is a, taking us a step further and encouraging you to, to keep track of what you find periodically over time so that you can start to see some of these trends. So there's certain types of plants or animals. Are, are there cer certain types of plants that the animals are rejecting? And are there certain plants that are gaining ground that you're not particularly excited about? Maybe different weeds or different plants? Uh, are the grasses having different recovery times than you'd like to see? And can you link those recovery times to, to different conditions, whether it's the seasonal conditions or irregular conditions like with drought or rains, and being able to, to document how long was that drought or how wet was it. And as you start to learn your pasture and your animals' behaviors uh, as, as they use the land, you might find that you find yourself going to some of these same areas in your pasture just to get a sense of what's going on in the pasture how the animals and the plants are interacting, which leads us to the second key concept, which uh, Susan Perry is going to explain. Oh, okay, slight delay. Technical difficulties, one second. Okay, I had minimized everything. I'm so sorry, folks. I had minimized so that I wasn't uh, looking at five different things and uh, wanted to make sure I was where I needed to be. So just a moment, let me get this back up. Okay, so uh, Jim, thank you, Jim. I just talked about walking the pasture and now it, oh, there we go. So all of this, all of monitoring uh, can be used can be said to be under a key area concept. And this is a, a concept that takes the pasture as a whole. And in walking the pasture, you pick a relatively small area or a management unit, say you have 100 acres. Again, this is a larger farm. If it's a small farm, you don't really need to apply this concept, but you're gonna select a, a location because of its, uh, its use or its value as a monitoring point because it's indicative of the entire current grazing management over the entire management unit or the entire pasture. So uh, these inventory and assessment procedure for pasture land should be conducted in these key representative areas of the farm, unless the overall acreage is, is small. The area's uh, inventory should not show excessive or negligible grazing effects, but should re represent the majority of the pasture areas managed. Remember that inventories and monitoring are conducted by walking around the area, not by standing in one spot. And that's a pretty basic uh, concept. So uh, this is a quote that I, I often go to from Bob Hendershot, who's a farmer and involved in the Grazing Coalition uh, work nationally, but from Ohio, he, you know, basically you can't manage what you really don't measure. So uh, the PCS, again, we'll talk about it in more detail later. It's a systematic way to assess how well a pasture is being managed and how well, how well the resources are being protected. And as NRCS employees, Jim and I's job is to, to help the farmer to help you protect those resources. It can also be a useful way to set up a monitoring program if you're a service provider uh, for a producer that's starting or really adapting their grazing system. So there's a lot of great uses that, that, sent that met, set that benchmarking and then look back in snapshots around the season or uh, from year to year. 
And uh, the reason, uh, and Jim mentioned I was on the national team for this, we really looked at a way to revise what had been done very early, 2001 it started, uh, to really look at um, how we could adapt this, that it would work in any state within the nation that has pasture systems. You know, some are looking at rangeland and there's a whole different protocol for rangeland, but we were talking about pasture systems, cool season, warm season. Um, it had to work also in arid or humid uh, climates like Alaska and um, Oregon is another one I think of that we really worked hard to make sure it worked anywhere. So I'm going to review the, the third, the second one that's on the list that we went, we started out with using a grazing stick. Most of you are probably familiar with grazing stick. Um, and we started about, started talking about very simple going out and looking at your pasture. So we're talking about getting measurements. We're starting to think about we can collecting data and actually writing it down that we can then reflect upon later on. Um, I know a couple of folks that uh, really believe in record keeping and say that, um, you know, the one from 35 years ago could tell you what pasture he used at what time of year, how many inches, how many times he moved them, which cow was in which pasture. So it really, uh, once you start doing this, you see the value in it. So um, those that have a grazing stick, you may not know where it came from. I'm just gonna tell you a, a real quick origin story about that. Um, it ha the story has it that researchers at Cornell started out you know, doing their forage sampling and looking at how they could develop a stick that um, folks could use in the field, not only to measure height, but to talk about what tools they could provide on this simple tool. Um, so with forage sampling analysis, they came up with a chart and the dry matter calculations that are behind the stick. So we're going to go into um, using that stick to actually keep records and uh, look from day to day or, or month to month or rotation to rotation how you're managing. So again, that we have the, the take half, leave half. We know that good pasture management requires rotating the livestock through paddock fields and saving some forage to let it store vegetative energy. That's the whole concept behind take half, leave half. A grazing stick allows us to not only measure the forage, but to translate that to pounds of dry matter and to modify stocking rates based on what we record. So we're gonna do a really quick pasture exercise that we use in Pennsylvania for our conservation staff training. So uh, this is using that key area concept. So you're gonna look and select a spot in the pasture that's representative of your pasture whether it's um, on, in terms of management, in terms of species content. So look for one, one key area or two or three spots and average your results. And then uh, one of the tricky parts is IDing forage types. I don't know how many, we can talk in the breakouts about how many really know their, their categories or their what we call functional groups, but you do need to know the forage type to be able to do this exercise. So for this, we're gonna use orchard grass and clover. You're gonna place a grazing stick on the ground. We're gonna find that sward that's typical of your entire pasture. And then you're gonna slide the stick with the chart side up. You can see the chart in this picture. Um, and you're gonna stand with your you know, feet balanced, shoulders, if you will, and you're gonna look down. You're not gonna move your head from side to side. You're just gonna look down and count the number of dots you have there. Uh, so in this uh, example, we see two dots. Next, you're gonna turn to your chart. And I know that the Pennsylvania sticks have this. I don't know if other states uh, use this, but um, the type you have to remember, again, the type of forage you had and the number of dots you counted. Then you're gonna compare it to the table that you see that says number of dots counted. And um, you're gonna compare that to that. And then um, you're gonna refer to the states, your states, um, estimates for forages, and that's where these numbers come from. For like orchard grass and clover in Pennsylvania, we have a forage chart that gives you typical yields in a grazing system, whether it's poorly grazed, good, good condition, or uh, you know, excellent condition. It will give you the pounds of dry matter per square inch per acre. Um, but this one gives you that. They did, did studies and came up with this chart. Again, if your state doesn't have it, go to extension and ask if they have it. Then you're gonna look again uh, for your key area and get the average. 
um, for the standing forage. So again, the first step is in our example, 308 pounds per acre per square per inch for orchard grass and clover, which is the, the top one on the second picture in, the, in this uh, chart. Um, and then you're gonna measure the average height of the standing forage. Again, you're gonna go to a key area, not just one blade of grass, but the bulk of the biomass that's, that's near you in the pasture where you did your dot chart. Um, and that will give you your tight, your, your standing forage, your height, I mean. Uh, in this example, it's seven inches. Then we're gonna refer, go back to the grazing stick. And you know, again, you, have to, you need to remember the, the, or write down the number of dots, the type of forage and the average height and then your pounds per acre inch for that forage that you got. And yes, there's math to this. So you're gonna recall that take half, leave half height and uh, step number seven says there, um, you're gonna get your inches. So we graze to three inches. We have four inches of available forage, okay? From that seven inches. So you're gonna have that. And uh, then you're going to multiply the available forage inches times your dry matter acre inch from the chart, and that gives you the pounds of available forage per acre. So in our math, we have four inches of, of available, 300 pounds per acre inch, and that makes 1,200 pounds per acre that you have available on that day in your, in your field. From that, you can take and, and figure out um, the animal and livestock dry matter needs. If you say you have beef, we go with like 3% would be a basic uh, dry matter percentage needs for that animal, the typical weight. And uh, if we took that into the 1200 pounds per acre, we could feed 30, approximately 36 cows per acre at this point in time. And uh, you can do this each time you rotate, um, you will get trained. I know a lot of farmers that start out using this and just know after a few months of using this, know what they have in their field just by looking out there or taking a walk. So um, I saw there was a question and I don't have my chat up. Um, if we can address that later, that'd be great. If it's a, a, a question or an issue that's up now, if somebody could let me know, that's great. Um, but I'm gonna move on if not. So the, the gonna, grazing stick. Gonna catch that question uh, in the in the in the conversation in the discussion. So that question will be answered coming up very shortly. Great, thanks, Jim. Okay, the next one we have on our list here is step point worksheet. Again, we're looking at data collection, so we're getting more formal as we go. Um, and uh, this with step point, we're it is subjective to a point. Again, you're the volunteer monitor, if you will, and it's subjective because there may be human error. But if you do it consistently, you're gonna get consistent results. And we're not experts, so you're, you're doing it yourself and you're doing it on key areas of yours or, or the pasture that we're working with. So step point um, is one of the tools for PCS. And we'll talk a little bit more at, in detail about PCS after we see the video and, and we're gonna go over each protocol, each indicator in the PCS. But um, the step point worksheet, which is shown here, now this is the Pennsylvania version um, there's also one in Excel that can be done on smartphones, but you're essentially, you're taking uh, readings every 10 steps, depending on the size of your field. It might be 25, it might be 50. I've done this a hundred times um, in a larger field. So you can really get a, a statistical inventory of what you have there. You're just gonna walk 10 steps, look down at your toe and record what's there. Um, you're also going to note your concentration areas. We all have um, traffic areas. You're gonna note where they are uh, while you're walking the pastures. Um, and you're gonna take a shovel or a probe with you. That's one of the tools we need for PCS, um, the new revised PCS, where we're really looking at the soil itself as well and compaction. So um, all of this can make your job easier, make your uh, operation more um, uh, definable and help you collect data that really can um, help you manage your pastures and we hear over and over, um, you know, that uh, it, it really does help folks. I've had a, a farmer tell me, I feel like I'm, I'm on the verge of becoming a scientist. So um, there's a lot of use for this and there's a lot of ways to make this valuable for you in your operation. So uh, I'm gonna stop here. Now the step point method that we just spoke about will then inform your PCS. There are 
and Jim will talk a little bit more about it. Um, this will um, give you five diff of the different indicators on that sheet that we showed you, the, the colored sheet. And um, we're gonna talk about it a little bit later, but that's the reason for doing the step point before you do the pasture condition scoring. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Jim, and uh, change the slide when you're ready. Great, all right, ready for next slide. Okay, so the plan for today is to spend most of our time talking about the pasture condition score sheet, uh, this thing that we have in front of us. We were trying really hard to get out into the field so that we could do this in person. It's always more effective if you can see, touch, feel uh, the product that you're working with. But with everything going on today that just didn't work out, we were able to to come up with a modified method where we had an opportunity to go out to one of one of the great farms uh, in the area and do a little bit of practice session with the PCS and dry matter and things like that. So we put together this uh, Rachel, uh, Rachel and the SAIR program. Uh, we're fortunate enough to put together this program for us, uh, this film for us, which is going to be very, just a very quick cursory overview of the pasture condition score sheet. So in just a moment, we'll, uh, I'm going to introduce the score sheet to you very quickly, but then this uh, 15 to 18 minute film is going to highlight each of the different topics that are on the pasture condition score sheet to give you some idea of, of what type of information is being looked for, a little bit of definition. So just to start out on this, uh, the pasture condition score sheet is just a method to uh, to be able to assess the pastures. And um, Susan, if we click on to the next one with the, the inset, the, it, it's very good to be able to document what you're seeing. So be, be sure to uh, identify which pasture you're in, what livestock you're working with. Uh, there's a section on here for identifying the soils, the ecological sites, and the forage suitabilities or the forage types that are in each field. And then there's an opportunity to document the conditions that are in the field. So is it seasonal? Is it, um, is it too wet? Is it too dry? Is it hot? Is it cool? So just be able to document some of the conditions that, that are influencing what you're seeing on, on your uh, condition score sheet. We'll go to the next slide. There are 10 different indicators, 10 different subjects that are gonna be discussed in this, in this film. And after the film, we're going to come back and we'll have an opportunity to talk through each one of those 10 items just very quickly. So as we're going through this film, please take notes, uh, write down any questions that you have, because we're going to have an opportunity to come back and you can ask direct questions about what did you mean about this? Or I missed the definition of any question that you have. Uh, please do write it down. But we're going to talk about these 10 subjects uh, on the score sheet. Uh, it's what we're calling a, a rubric where you can grade, this is subjective, but you can grade the conditions that you see on a scale of one through five. And there's different definitions written on the score sheet um, based, based on the uh, conditions that are on hand. All right, so that's, that's our process for this morning that we're hoping is gonna be effective. Uh, would value your feedback on how effective this is, but we're gonna stop the, the the presentation right now and uh, slide into a, a video production. And after the video production, we'll come right back. So we're gonna hand it off to, uh, to Rachel and we'll get that started. And please feel free to use the, the chat box if there's something going on, something's not working right. All right, so let me just get this started. Um and we, you should be hearing it in just a second. My name is Jenny Kipsakiewicz. I am the owner operator of Stonehill Farm located in Plainfield, Connecticut. We are an exclusive grass fed operation. We run registered red Devons and registered red Angus on 68 acres of land that we use to rotationally graze our herd. Our herd is moved every, approximately every 12 hours 
and this method allows us to give new food supply as well as improve our soil health and regrowth of our pastures. We learned that there's no like perfect recipe and that it's about trial and error. So the next season we divided our paddocks again, the following season we divided them into 12 and then our herd couldn't keep up any longer. We now have approximately 25 head of cattle, some horses that enjoy their time with them and rotate them twice a day. We have in seen improved soil health. We have seen improved organic matter. We have seen improved infiltration when we have rainwater that comes. We have learned that we don't make mistakes. We learn from our trials. And so every year is a different year and um, whether it's the, the weather conditions, the rain, the drought, the sun, um, whatever you may have. So we now have a very diverse species of grasses. Um, there is a large variety of legumes, cool season grasses. Um, and then, you know, let's talk about non-desirables. So someone might walk into our pasture and think that it's a weed, but it's only a weed if the animals don't touch it. And that has come over time. Um, animals that we first purchased on our farm didn't eat as much as animals that were born on our farm. Um, and so animals eat more and more and more every generation removed from their mother. So we generally graze our herd from about May 1st to November 1st, give or take how the season starts or how well the season finishes. But generally speaking, that's our grazing window. So another important aspect of our grass-fed herd is to make sure that we feed them through the winter months. We do that through wrapped round bales or baleage. These are bales that are intentionally um, cut in the hay field and wrapped fairly quick. So they are wet hay. Then they're wrapped in plastic and that preserves the um, hay. And it is a really high quality forage for them to have during the winter months. We do um, bale grazing. So that's where we take these bales and we put them in the pasture and that helps us build organic matter. It, they don't eat all the hay, so that leaves that hay behind, which then you know, is an input into our soil. So it's important to plan really well um, while the summer months are happening and we're growing hay, that we have enough hay on site for our animals for the winter. We only put our animals on the pasture so long as the ground is frozen, um, you know, because that December, January can be a really iffy time. And if the soil is still too wet, we don't want to put our animals on it because that increases compaction and we certainly don't want to do that. So bale grazing is um, our method of choice for our winter feeding. So we're going to take a quick look at uh, the plants, the animals, and the human aspect and how all of those things influence uh, the, the land management and some of the decisions that you make with the animals. Why would we take um, an assessment of the pasture? And again, that, that is largely just to be able to have, I'm gonna say animals that look like this. I think anyone would be interested to have animals with this kind of a, a body condition score, this kind of fill, uh, animal health. To be able to get all of that from the existing pasture is pretty fantastic. This particular pasture, I would say, is, is wonderfully diverse. It's got different types of grasses, different legumes, uh, some forbs. And so it's got all, it hits all those different um, targets that we talk about in, in the grazing aspect of it. When do we take this assessment? Ideally, you would take it at the same time every year. Ideally, just before you're going to start your grazing season, that gives you a consistent time to compare from year to year to year. If you're keeping records, you can compare each year. And if you take some additional notes on there about the, the weather conditions, if it was too hot, too cool, uh, a little bit too dry, too wet, you're recording what you have for, for growing conditions, um, any kind of problem areas, uh, being able to keep those kind of records from year to year will really help a lot too, in terms of being able to make dis uh, future decisions as well. But the other aspect too is that you should also take it anytime there's, um, anytime there's a need or an interest. So if you were going through a drought and you wanted to see what are your conditions right now, you could go ahead and, and take a, another measurement. That way you could see what is out there, how does that compare to your ideal conditions, and then you can take the, the information that you have from a drought condition and you can use that to prepare for future conditions, for a future drought. So I guess an important point in this assessment is that it is subjective. So it's going to be different for, for every person, but an important point is just that if you're doing something that's different than somebody else, 
don't even worry about it. If you're doing it the same way, if you're measuring your, your metrics the same way every year, then you're going to have consistent results. It doesn't matter so much whether or not they're accurate, but if they're consistent, then you'll be able to measure that change. And change is really what you're looking for. So are you happy with your pastures? Yes or no? Would you like your pastures to be better? Would you like to make something different? Percent desirable plants. So desirable plants can mean a lot of different things. So desirable plants for one person is going to be different for another farm. Animal species will have a lot to do with that. What kind of uh, animals you're going to run on there. If they prefer to, to browse or to graze, uh, graze aggressively or browse lightly. The, the type of plants that you'd like to see in the pasture as well will have a big influence. So there, there are benefits to having a lot of different plants in there. So even some of the traditional weeds do actually have some uh, nutritional value as well. They can carry a lot of different nutrients. Uh, the animals can do what they call self-medicate if they have an upset stomach or they feel that they need something, they will often be able to travel to these different plants, eat, eat the different plants and get those things that they need in their diet. So having, having a, a diversity of plants can do a lot of good things. Uh, it does some great things for the soil uh, with the different root uh, depths. The plants can go after different, uh, different amounts of moisture, different nutrients. They can bring those nutrients back up to the surface uh, into the roots and the shoot portion of it and cycle those nutrients uh, through the system again. The nutritional benefit of having that diverse plant species out there is, is one of the highest things. And percent leg legumes is a bit of a tricky one. And so that's where there is a sheet that shows some percentages on here. And these are available online, uh, but percent coverage is this on here. And so the, the percent legumes is tricky in a number of different ways because in this document, the pasture condition score and on a lot of forage systems, they're always talking about dry matter. And dry matter is the amount of forage that's available without water. So it's gone into an oven, it's, uh, it's lost all of its water, and it's just the dry portion of the grass that's left. By comparison, there was uh, an image that they have in there that looks like it's covering about 30% or so. But when you actually dry it down, it comes down to about half that in terms of dry matter. The live plant is really just looking for what's still attached and still actively growing. So the caveat with that one is that if you were to do this during a drought or in the off season, uh, you can absolutely do that. We just give a tug on, on the grasses and we see which ones come up. So uh, the grasses that are typically no longer living or active are typically not going to be attached as well. And uh, you, give a, you give them a quick tug, and if you can pull up too much grass in your hand, we're, we're believing that that's no longer alive and active. But if it's still solid and actively, actively rooted in there, then we would say that that would be the live plant. Plant diversity, again, by dry weight. This is looking at a couple of different things. It's looking at largely the different plant types. So in terms of a forage system, a lot of what they're looking at is, uh, are they grasses, legumes, forbs? Uh, with the grasses, you can break it down into warm season versus cool season. But being able to look at the different, uh, the different types of forages out there will give you some idea of what, what's out there for diversity. As long as you can recognize the different types of plants that are out here, and you can record the differences between the grasses, the differences between the legumes, such as the clovers, if you can identify those types of differences in here, and you can write that down as the diversity. And so uh, I wouldn't worry so much about making sure that you get the exact correct uh, species correct on all these forages. That's fun to learn, it's great knowledge, but, uh, but the more important part that we're looking for really is just the types, the, the numbers for the diversity that's out here. Residue and litter compared to the live grass. So again, just like the example that we gave with uh, being able to give a tug on what's in, the, in front of you, whatever comes up is considered the dead portion, but looking at what's on top of the soil too, uh, can you see a lot of that litter? Old grass stems, grass leaves, uh, flower parts, uh, so any part of the, the above ground portion of the plant that's no longer actively growing, but still part of the ecosystem, uh, part of the nu nutrient cycling, that would be part of the litter that's on there. And that's considered a, a really important part because it, 
it's a strong indicator of what's going on with that with the pasture ecosystem. The next few questions are going to be more about the animals and, and the animal behavior, how they're using those forages. So the next one on the list is grazing utilization. And this is basically looking at what is the animal behavior on the pasture. There's a number of ways to influence animal behavior. The amount of area that they have can be a big influence. Uh, the free choice, meaning can they go to their favorite areas and hang out there? Or do they need to, I'm going to say, get to work? And they start here and they go to there because they know that their, their next meal is, is when they get to the end. Seeing a lot of evenness across here. I'm not seeing patches of low growth in one area, patches of high growth in another area. Uh, from what I see right here, just a, a nice even stand uh, across the whole, the whole pasture. Looking at the livestock concentration areas, a similar concept, just being able to look out across the landscape, seeing if the, there is any obvious signs of areas where the animals are hanging out more than, more than they should, more than the grass can support. What happens when uh, we've exceeded the carrying capacity of the land? So if the animals are eating too much of the grass or their hooves are damaging too much of the roots, the land can't support that. And so we'd be looking for some, some, um, some balance between all of that. So if we can provide the animals with a place to go when the grass needs a rest, uh, whether that's in the wintertime, springtime, wet time, if we can balance the time on the grass versus the time off the grass. Uh, the gate changes, so where the animals come in, come out. Uh, oftentimes around uh, animal waterers uh, is a good place to hang out. And then uh, we'll see it a lot around the shade tree too. If there's, if there's just occasional shade, uh, we'll see some pretty, pretty heavy, heavily used areas underneath the shade. So soil compaction is something that, uh, that Jenny definitely has experience with out here on the farm. And so this is, this is uh, a really fun exercise for a number of different reasons, but took a soil profile here just very quickly with the shovel. Before you go into the pasture, step off to the side near the fence line or uh, in the wood line. Step on the, uh, the shovel to push it into the soil. How hard does it push in? If you jump on it, does it, does it go right in? Uh, do you have to jump a couple times? In my opinion, the amount of root that is in the soil has done so much to loosen up this soil from the work that was done here over the years. If you wanted to get a little bit more sciency about it and, uh, and put some numbers to it, there is this uh, neat little gadget called the soil penetrometer. It measures resistance in the soil. So it's got a, a tip on the end, a spring in the middle. And if you, uh, again, not too concerned about the numbers, the numbers do have uh, uh, meaning, but the most important point is, can you, push, can you push this into the soil or not? Rocks are always present, right? But, um, you know, how hard or how easy is it to push into the soil? This is pretty easy to push in the soil. I'm really liking this. I would encourage you to only use the numbers if you're in, um, in wet conditions. Not, not so wet that you are creating puddles when you're walking, but uh, this would be a pretty ideal time. It's what we would call field moist conditions. So it rained, the water went in, but the, the ground, the, the water has drained continues to drain from there. So there's no ponded water, but uh, the water, the soil is nice and moist. And that's, that is the right time to do, uh, to record the numbers if you wanted to record numbers that's on there. Uh, when the soil is too dry, uh, that's not a good time to record numbers, but it is a good time to record relative. So relative to a non-production area, a forested area or under the fence line, relative to uh, the non-production area, are you looking at higher or lower uh, resistance into your soil? If you get what they call a spade slice, meaning that you, you pull a chunk of soil out and then you move back on the hole just a little bit and then take a slice of soil out of there, you can get a little bit of a soil profile on here. This is not a great example, but on here you can see, uh, what I see is, uh, is a little bit difference in the colors. So we've got a nice root dark, root zone up here where all the uh, all the work is happening with the roots the soil uh, soil moisture soil nutrients and then we've got uh, a little bit lighter layer a little bit more reddish brown color just below that so the organic matter is that contributing a lot to that dark rich color and then less organic matter a uh, little bit different different structures down in the lower portion of it but it's a, it's a neat way to kind of see what's going on under that soil 
Again, you can kind of measure some changes on here when you send in for a soil, uh, a soil analysis, a soil test. Uh, what you're really measuring is that root zone. The reason you're testing that root zone is because that's where the nutrients are coming from. When you, when you pull a soil out and when you can take some chunks of that soil, you get some chunks out of there, you'll be able to see how well does that soil stay together. This is a, this is a, a bit of a cheater example here, but just for example, you can see that this is the grassy, the grassy area, but it, when we pull a chunk of soil out, it comes out with all that roots and all the soil attached to the roots. And that's just a, a good indicator that good things are happening with the roots, the soil biology, uh, all the sugars and everything else that's going on in that soil biology system that you want to see happening. So if the soil is sticking to those roots, uh, we consider that a really good thing. That's contributing largely to the soil structure, um, helping to get that water, uh, any precipitation, getting that into the soil. When we have uh, enough water or too much water that's going down the direction we want it to go. If it's a little, getting a little bit too dry and there's enough moisture below, that'll really help bring that soil, uh, that water back up into the soil profile. So it, it, uh, it absolutely works in both directions in terms of uh, roots, soil structure, and water movement. It helps the water go down, it helps the water come back up when it's needed. So it does a lot of good things. Um, but that, that rooting and the soil, soil holding capacity is, uh, is fantastic. Quick explanation on plant vigor is, uh, is really related to the recovery on here. So the last time that this was grazed? May 6th. Is, is anybody unhappy with this regrowth? <laughs> <laughs> it seems pretty great. Uh, so the vigor seems pretty great. If this area were stunted, uh, we were not getting the growth or the height that, that you were looking for in your pasture, then you would score it accordingly. Um, coloration is a big one. If uh, you've got the yellow, the yellow color in the leaves, could be indication of high moisture content, uh, being in a wet area where the nitrogen, nitrogen doesn't have a chance to process into the, into the plant, uh, anaerobic conditions. Uh, it all, if it's a drier area, again, looking at nutrients or looking at other, other factors that could be uh, slowing that plant growth down from coming up. So. Uh, taking a look at the plant color, the plant height, uh, the plant stage of growth, uh, if it's going very quickly from the vegetative stage into the reproductive stage, that could signify that this plant's pretty stressed out and it thinks it better reproduce before it's gone. So if it's, if it's uh, going into the reproductive stage too soon, uh, that could be an indicator that something, something needs to be looked at too. So the last section on here is just about the soil, fairly, fairly simple terms, but it's looking at the sheet and reel erosion, which is basically overland flow. So when the water is raining faster than the soil can absorb it, uh, you get overland flow. So if the water is flowing across the soil, is it moving the soil or is the soil staying in place? If it's moving the soil, is it moving just the surface, surface particles? That would be sheet and rill. Is it moving chunks of soil? That would be uh, gullies or ephemeral erosion. So ephemeral erosion would be, I'm gonna say a small gully, uh, a gully that comes somewhat seasonally. In cropped fields, it's easy to imagine. Um, early in the spring, when the, when the crops are short, there's a lot more soil surface exposed, and that might be a seasonal gully that, that ends up going through there and then a, a classic gully would be something that you're not going to want to drive over. It's, it's kind of there. That's, that's the direction that the water's going. And, but also a problem, leading, leading to uh, a lot of soil loss. Other types of erosion, though, that, are, that can be present would be the wind erosion. So uh, typically on the larger areas, this is a, a nice sized field for Connecticut. Um, on some, some of these larger fields, uh, when they're open, you can get a nice puff of dust. You would want to see, are the stream banks stabilized by nice plant growth, root growth, or are they continuously falling in or being trampled, uh, leading to soil being exposed and, and uh, subject to being lost as the water water's moving down the stream bank.
All right, that was the end of that portion of it. And uh, so now we're just going to do a little bit of quick organization. Um, Rachel, do you want to do you want to give us direction on what's going to happen next? Yep, yep. So I think what we'll do um, is jump right into our breakout rooms. We did have a few slides prepared uh, to discuss more in detail on each one of those indicators. Um, but with in the interest of running behind a bit, I think we'll jump into our breakout rooms and we can get into the nitty gritty and specifics of what people have for questions. So we're not covering things that you don't have questions on uh, and we don't get to the things that you do want to know more about. So um, I'm going to start the breakout sessions now. We will be in, in each session or the session for probably about 25 minutes and then we'll come back to our um, main room here and We'll get everybody um, kind of a summary and, and everybody's last comments, and then we'll send you off for the day. So um, give me just a second and let me get the breakout room started. What I'll do is um, uh, we were hoping to get a, a just a quick recap of each breakout room and a little summary, maybe some uh, good comments from both Susan and Jim uh, in terms of what their conversation was within each session. Uh, so I'll turn it over to the two of you. Would you like to go first, Jim? Uh, we can flip a coin. Uh, why don't yeah. you go first? I'll, I'll, I'll go second. Okay, okay. Um, always fascinating meeting folks and it was a small enough breakout that I, First, asked everyone to introduce themselves, and and we had one NRCS soil con, a soil conservationist that's just starting out working with pastures, and we the sister was on, and uh, you've, she's got a fascinating dairy operation with a small herd on small number of acreages, and then Nick, who I've met before in breakouts, is kind of in the in the more advanced level. I don't, I think it's just under five years that that you're grazing, Nick, um, but you learn a lot in that time, and and admitting that. Using the grazing stick and using measurement helps at first, but a lot of it becomes an art form. You know, a lot of it becomes, I know now how to measure the pasture. I know when to move the, the animals. I kind of have a feel for my undesirables. So we went through all of the questions that uh, the three of us, Rachel, Jim and I had, uh, had gone and, and just asked specific questions, um, got some feedback and I hope sister that we helped um, you on your your quest to do a better job and and to uh, move on as far as uh, developing that pasture system. I think it all is very helpful to me to talk to you all and, and see what's out there and and hopefully it was helpful to you too. And that's all I'll say at this point. Go ahead, Jim. Excellent. All right. Well, in summary, uh, I I maybe did a little bit more talking than I should have, but we talked. We talked a bit about uh, some of the common uh, common problems or questions people run into when trying to go through the pasture condition score sheet. One of those is just trying to understand what dry matter means. Uh, so there was a there was a fair bit of effort in the filming to to explain what dry matter and and how to guesstimate what those values are. Uh, uh, let's see, going through a memory lapse here. Uh, we had some uh, some really helpful comments about uh, about the film uh, being having the visuals to go along with the film uh, that worked out really well. So appreciate these efforts to, to be able to put the film together uh, for people to come back to and look at. Uh, we talked just a little bit about breaking the problems into subgroups. Uh, so while this is a topic of ten, if we can break it into the subgroups of of plants, animals. And soils, uh, and at least in my in one perspective, in my perspective, that helps uh, make it make the problems a little bit more approachable in terms of where to start and how how to start it. Um, having had a great comment about um, how do you pri prioritize? Do you, do you start with uh, the animals, the plants, or the soils? And and uh, a common recommendation is to uh, make sure that your soils are in a good place, uh, at least with the soil testing, uh, soil coverage with the plants. Uh, all of those types of things. So the soils uh, are, I don't want to say an, an easy place to start, but they're a, a nice place to start because that is your growing medium. Uh, I had one more point. 
sorry. Uh, the last one I think was just on what do you do now that you have a number? So you went through, you calculated your numbers, and now what do you do? And so uh, just a little bit of time talking about recording values over time and then looking for change over time and breaking it out, uh, being able to identify what the different problem areas are. That's about it. Oh, geez, we, I wish I'd have done what you did, but you know, I think it's all helpful conversation. And I would urge all of you to uh, review the PCS guide, look at the video again, and then come back with any questions. Um, we're both and all available for your questions. And uh, thanks, Jim. That sounds like you really got into the meat of it. Thank you both for, for recapping for us. Um, and I will uh, reiterate what Susan and Jim both said in terms of reaching out at any time with additional help. Um, that pretty much wraps up what we had on, on board for today in terms of pasture condition scoring. Uh, so I just want to remind everybody that there is another webinar uh, that our project is hosting on August 25th. It's a Wednesday, uh, two weeks from today. Uh, we'll be discussing some grazing management and how to analyze it and provide feedback to uh, one of our uh, farmer producers who has been a, a large part of our project. Um, of course, the, all of the content from today's uh, webinar will be posted on our website. Um, so our PowerPoint, as well as the uh, video. Uh, another note too, is that there are several videos that were produced this year in the field that we did not share today. Uh, one of which is a pasture stick video. A second is uh, how to take a dry matter sample. All of those will be up on our website. Keeping in mind that we do have a new website now, uh, which is livestock.extension.ucon.edu. Uh, if you didn't get that down, um, maybe Jean, if you wouldn't mind, or Francis, if you wouldn't mind actually putting a little link in. I see Joe's working on that too, thank you. Um, uh, or uh, of course it is linked, so go ahead and go back to our old website and we'll, bring, we'll redirect you to our new website. Um, so all of that information will be up there today. If for some reason anybody in today's group did, does not have a pasture stick, uh, reach out and I will connect you with um, somebody closest to you, your closest NRCS field office that can get you a pasture stick. Um, lastly, just real quick, if you wouldn't mind again, taking the post evaluation uh, survey for us, that is the link is in the chat box. Uh, again, going through the same steps that we did earlier uh, to um, uh, just answer a few of those questions and then hitting that green submit button on the bottom, I would appreciate that. Rachel, uh, while people are filling out the survey, I, I had mentioned that we would make sure to answer I think it was Andrew's question. Uh, I did not touch on that with my group. Could I touch on that just very quickly? Sure, absolutely, yep. Uh, in 30 seconds or less, uh, the question about how do you measure the height of your forage, uh, a simple or fun explanation of that is if you were to lay a piece of paper down on the canopy. So it's actually the canopy height that's on there. So, uh, so it's not the, it's not the length of the grass, it's not the height, it's, it's just the, the average canopy height, as if you were to lay a piece of paper or something flat across the plants, that would be your average canopy height. And that's, that's what the numbers are, are calibrated to on the, on the stick, if that makes sense. Jim, you go into some detail on that in the patch stick, video too. So um, again, all of that will be posted on the website uh, within the next week or so. Uh, so you'll see that there. Um, another quick tidbit of information that I know some of you are uh, familiar with or know that's coming is a fencing uh, clinic workshop. I know that there's been a lot of interest from our SARE group uh, to have a fencing clinic. 
So we don't have a time at the moment, but um, the Southern New England Grazing Network is working very closely with uh, actually Stonehill Farm, who was featured in this video that you saw today. Uh, they will be uh, focusing on um, anything relating to fencing uh, with Wells Cross. Uh, they'll be coming down and setting up a bunch of um, different, uh, as long as I'm remembering correctly, Jim, different fencing systems and, and things like that. So a lot of hands-on uh, explanation there that day. I do not have a time, but as soon as I have more information on that, I will share it with our SAIR group as well. Just wanted to get you guys uh, on the calendar for that if, uh, if you are interested. It's September 11th.